So hi again. In the last video we saw when we want to isolate a mitochondria or work with permeabilized systems. In this video I'm going to talk about how to measure mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation in isolated mitochondrial preparations or permeabilized systems. And here I'm assuming, because this is a graduate course, that all of you have a basic understanding of how mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation happens, that all of you have done an undergrad course in which you had that content. If you did not do that, please stop this video and study oxidative phosphorylation in a basic undergrad course because I'm not going to go over all that again. I'm just going to remind you that oxidative phosphorylation happens because of the mitochondrial proton circuit. So if you have NADH-linked substrates, electrons are going to flow through complex 1, ubiquinone, complex 3, cytochrome C, and complex 4, and they're going to reduce oxygen to water. This flow is going to be coupled in complexes 1, 3, and 4 to the proton pumping from the mitochondrial matrix into the intracrystal space, um, generating proton motive force. And proton motive force is what allows ATP to be synthesized and released in ATP synthase. This release is coupled to the re-entry of protons through the ATP synthase. Uh, that's with NADH-linked substrates. FAD-linked substrates such as succinate are going to donate electrons from their dehydrogenases to ubiquinone then complex 3, cytochrome C, complex 4. So you're going to have less protons pumped because you're only going to have protons pumped through complex 3 and complex 4. But also generating this proton circuit in which protons come back through ATP synthase, and this is associated with the release of ATP within the mitochondrial matrix. Now this proton circuit can actually be thought about as a very simple electrical circuit in which you have a battery and you have a light bulb, the light bulb being the ATP synthase. Um, a condition in which you have this light bulb turned off for any reason, for example, if you inhibited ATP synthase with oligomycin, is a condition in which you're going to have a buildup of a very high voltage, very high proton motive force. Under these conditions, electron transport is going to be slow, it's going to be inhibited, you're going to have low current because it's very difficult to pump protons against high voltage. So all the reactions of electron transport in the electron transport chain are going to be inhibited and you're going to have low current or low electron transport. You're also going to have low ATP production because we inhibited ATP production. Another situation is a situation in which you actually have a functional ATP synthase, your light bulb is on. This is going to use some energy, so you're going to have a slightly lower voltage, pretty normal voltage, and this is going to allow for electron transport. So you're going to have electron transport coupled to generating this membrane potential, and here you really have the proton circuit happening. Uh, you're going to have normal current, and you're going to have ATP production. Finally, you can short circuit the system. You can basically allow the protons to re enter the mitochondrial matrix through a pathway that's not ATP synthase. This is going to decrease the voltage and is going to increase electron transport a lot. So you're going to have very high current because it's very easy to pump protons against a very low proton motive force. Under these conditions, you have no ATP production because you don't have the voltage, you don't have proton motive force for this ATP production. And that, in a nutshell, is the mitochondrial proton circuit. Now this is a very simplified proton circuit because it assumes that protons are pumped out by the electron transport chain and only come back in either through ATP synthase or through a short circuit. In real life, things are a little bit different. In real life, mitochondria use proton motive force for a number of transport functions besides synthesizing ATP. So very importantly, to make ATP, mitochondria need ADP. And ADP enters the mitochondrial matrix in exchange for ATP. There's an exchanger that brings ADP in and takes ATP out. ADP has three negative charges. ATP has four negative charges. So when you exchange ADP for ATP, you're basically throwing a negative charge outside mitochondria, which is equivalent 
to putting a proton, a positive charge, inside the mitochondrial matrix. So ADP being present for the ATP synthase actually requires proton motive force because that's what fuels the translocase to exchange ADP for ATP. Phosphate is also transported into mitochondria in conjunction with a proton. Uh, the support of a proton with phosphate means that the phosphate transport also uses the proton gradient to transport phosphate into mitochondria. So in order to have phosphate and ADP for ATP to be synthesized, we also use the proton circuit. And it's just not phosphate and, and not only uh, ADP that require this proton circuit. There are all sorts of other mitochondrial intermembrane proteins that use this proton circuit as a source of energy for their function. We're going to see later on when we talk about oxidants and antioxidants in mitochondria that the transhydrogenase, an enzyme that generates NADPH in mitochondria, uses the proton potential to reduce NADPH. We're also going to talk about ion transport, transport of calcium, transport of protons through uncoupling proteins. All of these are using the proton potential as a source of energy for their transport. And finally, very importantly, never forget that substrate uh, transport into the mitochondrial matrix. So transport of pyruvate, of succinate, alpha-ketoglutarate, malate, all of those require co-transports with protons. Therefore, they're also using the mitochondrial proton circuit as a source of energy to generate the entry of these substrates into mitochondria. So real-life mitochondrial proton circuitry is a lot more complex than just the respiratory chain and ATP synthase. Now, how do you measure mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation? How do you measure the proton circuit? How do you measure this function of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation? If you have to do one single measurement of mitochondrial function to determine oxidative phosphorylation, the measurement that I would uh, suggest that you do very strongly is a measurement of oxygen consumption. This is the best measurement in order to determine oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria because it's a direct measurement. You are measuring the consumption of oxygen, that's a substrate in oxidative phosphorylation, and formation of water from this oxygen. You're measuring it directly without adding some kind of probe to mitochondria. And as we will see when we measure membrane potentials, when you add a probe, you have complicating factors involved and then you have to have more controls in order to make sure that you're doing these measurements properly. So uh, measuring oxygen consumption is direct and therefore you don't have these artifacts. Finally, it's quantitative. So you're gonna actually know how much oxygen was consumed in a quantitative measurement. Uh, this is gonna tell you how many electrons reduce this oxygen. So quantitative bioenergetics is really important and quantitative biochemistry in general is something that we should be doing more of. How do you measure oxygen consumption in isolated mitochondria or in permeabilized cell systems? Uh, one of the best ways to do so is using Clark-type electrodes. So Clark-type electrodes are a very old piece of machinery in labs. These are platinum electrodes uh, with sulfur references. And basically, the platinum electrode is going to be oxidized by oxygen, generating a recording that's going to be proportional to the amount of oxygen in the system. What you do is you separate this electrode from your suspension in which you have your biological material with a membrane that's permeable to oxygen, typically a Teflon membrane. And then you have your suspension with your mitochondria or your permeabilized cells, and you have constant stirring. Because the concentration of oxygen that reaches the electrode is gonna be proportional to the concentration in the system, and also to the speed in which you're stirring the system. So you really have to have constant stirring in order to measure oxygen consumption uh, in, in a precise manner. Um, what type of Clark electrodes exist? There are lots of different Clark electrodes available. Mitochondrial biologists tend a lot to use Ouroboros type Clark electrodes. And the reason for this is, first of all, these were developed by a group that studies mitochondrial bioenergetics, so they're very functional in terms of use for mitochondrial bioenergetic studies. And secondly, this is a very robust system. It's, it's a very long-lasting electrode. It doesn't break down very easily. 
uh, it's, it's a quality system in that sense versus Clark type electrodes that we had before the Autobotto system usually had to be exchanged all the time. They, they were much more fickle and, and less long lasting. Um, you're going to see two brands that sell equipment for oxygen consumption measurements talked about a lot when you talk about mitochondrial measurements. One is Autobotos and the other is the Seahorse Analyzer. Sometimes these two are seen as competitors. I don't think they are at all. I think these are very different pieces of equipment with very different uses and I think they're both excellent pieces of equipment for their specific uses. So I'm going to talk about Seahorse uh, bioanalyzers when we talk about intact cells. They're excellent for measuring oxygen consumption in intact cells. And you can use them also to measure oxygen consumption in isolated mitochondria or permeabilized cells if you want. Um, they're not the best or the easiest or even the cheapest system to measure oxygen consumption in isolated mitochondria. That would be Clark-type electrodes such as autobotos. So different applications, different levels of flexibility, both excellent equipments. Uh, Autobotus is actually very flexible. You could just about put anything in this chamber. Isolated mitochondria, permeabilized cells, whole organisms that are small enough, C. elegans, for example, pieces of tissue, and you can measure both oxygen consumption and oxygen production. So you can also use these electrodes to measure, for example, catalase activity that's going to produce oxygen. So a very flexible kind of system, and we use it a lot. Uh, if you're interested in doing oxygen consumption measurements with Clark-type electrodes, it would be interesting to visit uh, the wiki page of this company. They have a lot of information on how to do experiments also, because this is, is a group that works with mitochondrial bioenergetics. They also do courses and stuff like that. So how does one typically measure mitochondrial respiration? So classically, mitochondrial respiration is measured under different respiratory states, which reflect different functional situations of mitochondria. And these respiratory states have names. They actually have numbers in terms of what they're measuring. So typically, classically, you would start a mitochondrial oxygen consumption um, experiment by adding mitochondria into media that has a concentration of oxygen that is high, and then following how this concentration of oxygen varies over time, which is what you see here. So you're going to see a rate in which this oxygen consumption decreases once mitochondria start to consume oxygen. Um, this is a very classical way of showing this experiment. You could also depict this experiment as the oxygen consumption rate itself, so the derivative of this uh, decrease in oxygen uh, concentration that you're seeing here. Both are equivalent. It's just that we see a lot more of this kind of graph because this is how we used to do it years ago. So it's, it's more common to see the oxygen concentration over time than the oxygen consumption over time. Anyways, uh, the experiment typically started in what we call state one. And what is state one? It's just mitochondria added to media with nothing else. There's no substrate, there's no ADP here. And that's the reason why you don't see state one in the literature almost at all. If you don't have any substrate, mitochondria aren't doing much, they're not consuming oxygen, oxygen concentrations stay constant over time, and it's not a very useful kind of measurement. The next state is respiratory state two. Now state two is a little confusing in the literature. Some people call state two the addition of ADP, but no substrate while other people, and this is more common, call state two the addition of substrate, in this case here succinate, it could have been pyruvate malate, could have been a different substrate, but no ADP is added. So if you give mitochondria a substrate, but they still don't have ADP, they're gonna to start to have electron transport and oxygen consumption, so you see a decrease in oxygen concentrations over time. How much oxygen is going to be consumed is going to depend on how much ADP there is already in this mitochondrial preparation, and there usually is a little bit, and it's also going to depend on the integrity of the inner mitochondrial membrane to protons. So state two is a little bit of a dirty condition in which to measure mitochondrial function because you actually don't know how much contaminating ADP, so how much oxidative phosphorylation 
is happening under state two. State three is a more commonly seen respiratory state uh, in papers. And state three is a condition in which you have oxidative phosphorylation. So what happened here is that you added ADP and phosphate. And because you added ADP and phosphate, ATP synthase starts to work. This is going to decrease the proton motive force and is going to increase the current. So you're going to have more oxygen consumption faster decrease in oxygen concentration over time. This is a measurement of oxygen consumption in the presence of maximized oxidative phosphorylation because you added ADP plus phosphate. State four is gonna happen either when ADP finishes, if you added a quantity that's small enough that it's gonna be all phosphorylated into ATP and there's no more ADP, or when you add oligomycin or another inhibitor of ATP synthase that's not going to allow for ATP synthesis anymore. So under these conditions, you again have slower oxygen consumption, slower decrease of oxygen concentration over time. And here, the decrease in oxygen concentration is going to be proportional to the permeability of the membrane to protons independently of ATP synthase. Finally, very Typically, people will add an uncoupler to this assay, and by adding an uncoupler, you're removing the proton motive force, you're allowing protons to return into mitochondria, and we call this state three uncoupled. We call it state three because it's fast respiration, so there's a lot of electron transport, but here, this respiration is increased by the presence of uncoupler and not by the presence of oxidative phosphorylation. If you allow mitochondria to respire quickly for some time in a closed chamber, what's going to happen is that oxygen is going to end, and that's the last respiratory state, which is state five. State five is respiration in the absence of oxygen, and obviously if you don't have oxygen, you don't have oxygen consumption, and that's basically why you probably never heard of state five before. It's not a very relevant situation, we usually don't include that in publications, but if you're doing this trace in real life, there is a point in which you will reach this no oxygen condition, and that's known as state five respiration. So those are the different respiratory states. I want to make a few comments about respiratory state measurements in the literature that I think are important. First of all, you will see quite commonly People doing measurements in state two, in other words, respiration just with substrate but without an ATP synthase inhibitor, and call it state four. That's because state two and state four can actually be quite similar because you don't have added ADP, you don't have oxidative phosphorylation. They can be quite similar, but again, state two can have some contaminating ADP in your preparation, and you never really know how much there is. Therefore, I really don't recommend doing state two measurements. I recommend adding an ATP synthase inhibitor and having a pure state four situation if you want to measure how much uh, electron transport you have in the absence of oxidative phosphorylation, and that's what state four is. Another comment is that you will sometimes see authors call state four uncoupled respiration. And the logic behind this is that the oxygen consumption that you have in state four is related to how much proton permeability your inner membrane has. Um, so this would be a measurement of how uncoupled your mitochondria are. The problem with this term is that uncoupled respiration could very easily be interpreted as respiration in the presence of uncoupler, which is state 3U. So I really don't recommend using the term uncoupled respiration for state 4. I think it becomes very confusing, uh, and people can interpret this as respiration in the presence of an uncoupler. If you don't want to call state 4 state 4, you can call it oligomycin insensitive respiration respiration in the presence of an ATP synthase inhibitor, which I think is a precise description of what it is and doesn't generate this confusion. Also very commonly, you will see in the literature people measuring respiratory control ratios, which is the division of the rate of oxygen consumption in state three and the rate of oxygen consumption in state four. Respiratory control ratios are kind of interesting because they give you an idea of how coupled mitochondria are. 
The less respiration you have in state four, the higher respiratory control ratios you will have, and therefore that indicates higher coupling. You have less proton leak that's not related to ATP synthesis. Respiratory control ratios can also be used uh, as a manner to control for your mitochondrial preparation. If you have good mitochondrial preparations in which you damage these mitochondria very little during isolation, you should have high respiratory control ratios. So that's what you measure in respiratory states. What do these measurements mean? So if you have a change in different respiratory states, how do you interpret that in terms of mitochondrial function and how it changed? So let's say under an experimental condition, I have a change in state two. What does that mean? I don't really think that means much. Um, state two, as I told you, can be a little dirty. You never know how much contaminants you have in terms of substrates for oxidative phosphorylation, in terms of ADP and phosphate. So I wouldn't take a change in state two respiration as meaning much. What does a change in state three respiration mean? So state three respiration is a condition in which you have oxidative phosphorylation. Electron transport is faster because you have a decrease in proton motive force because of the activity of ATP synthase. So two things can change state three respiration. A change in electron transport capacity, so the capacity to reduce oxygen in the electron transport chain, or a change in ATP synthase capacity, or a change in the ability to produce ATP. Both of these can change state three. What would change state four respiration? So in state four, you have no more ADP, or you have an inhibitor of the ATP synthase. Protons are not returning through ATP synthase. They're actually accumulating, generating very high proton motive force, which is going to decrease your current. It's going to decrease oxygen consumption rates. So oxygen consumption rates under these conditions are going to be related to a change in proton permeability in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So state four respiration changes indicate a change in the ability of the inner mitochondrial membrane to be impermeable to protons. Finally, what does a change in respiratory control ratio mean? The ratio between state three and state four. Change in respiratory control ratio means a change in coupling, a change in the ability of the inner membrane to be impermeable to protons, or a change in ATP synthesis capacity also. Uh, you could also have a change in respiratory substrate use involved in changes in respiratory control ratios, such as a change between FAD-linked and NADH substrates. We also could have a change in state 3U, or respiration in the presence of an uncoupler. What does that mean? If you have an uncoupler, you have maximized electron transport because you don't have the barrier of the proton motive force for electron transport. So a change in state 3U means a change in electron transport capacity. So with one trace, one experiment, you can uncover all sorts of potential changes in your mitochondrial function by measuring these different respiratory states, and specifically by measuring states 3, states 4, and states 3U. These are the states that are really going to give you information about mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Now that's a very classical experiment looking at respiratory states. There are a few other experiments that you can use by measuring oxygen consumption. One of them is having an idea of why you have a change in electron transport capacity. So let's say in that other experiment you saw a difference in state 3U, which indicates that you have a change in electron transport capacity when it's maximized by the presence of an uncoupler. What you can do now is try to pinpoint the point within the electron transport chain in which you have a change in electron transport capacity. And you can do this by adding different substrates and inhibitors of the different respiratory complexes. So you can start out with complex one linked substrates, NADH linking uh, generating molecules, such as pyruvate and malate, for example, and measure respiration under these conditions. Then you add rotenone, which is an inhibitor of complex one. After that, you add succinate, which is going to donate electrons to complex two. Now, complex one is not working because rotenone is there, so only electrons going through complex two 
three and four now are going to reduce oxygen. By measuring the difference in oxygen consumption under this condition and this condition, you can actually pinpoint if you have a change in complex one or a complex two activity, or if this change is in complexes three and four further on, it's going to be conserved under these two conditions. You can now add antimycin or another inhibitor of mitochondrial complex three, blocking complex three, and then measure oxygen consumption with substances that donate electrons to cytochrome C and complex four, such as TMPD in the presence of ascorbate. It's not a natural substrate for mitochondria, it's an artificial electron donating system, but it serves the purpose of measuring the activity of cytochrome C and complex four without the activity of complexes three, two, and one. And finally, you can measure cyanide in sensitive respiration to see respiration that's independent of complex four, typically present uh, in non-mammalian organisms. Uh, there are some organisms that have a lot of cyanide and sensitive respiration, actually. So this is, again, one assay. You're adding these things in sequence in which you can pinpoint the parts of the electron transport chain that have different activity. It's kind of an interesting experiment to do. Another type of experiment that measures coupling with the very sensitive uh, ability to measure coupling is the measurement of ADPO or PO ratios. This is actually how much oxygen, and here it's the atom of oxygen, not the oxygen molecule, uh, is necessary to phosphorylate one ADP molecule. And the way you do this is you add very well titrated quantities of ADP to mitochondria. So you prepare a solution with a small quantity of ADP and you titrate the solution, you determine its concentration very specifically, add a small quantity and see how much oxygen is consumed until this ADP is exhausted and mitochondria go back into state four spontaneously. So you can actually calculate how many electrons were used to reduce oxygen uh, to phosphorylate these ADP molecules. This is a very sensitive measurement uh, to measure changes in coupling. So you're gonna have more oxygen consumed per ADP molecule if you have less coupling in mitochondria. It's not an easy measurement to do. You have to have very good mitochondrial preparations you can't have any destruction of mitochondria because broken down mitochondria will break down the ATP produced by the intact mitochondria. And you also have to titrate this ADP very carefully. But it's actually a really good measurement if you want to have a lot of sensitivity in terms of measuring changes in coupling. Um, in addition to these other kinds of experiments you can do, for a few things you should consider. Uh, you should consider what substrate you're going to use in your experiment. You can use NADH-linked substrates, such as pyruvate. Pyruvate alone often does not make mitochondria respire well. Uh, you often need an intermediate of the Krebs cycle to really get the oxalic acetate uh, sufficient in these mitochondria to make the Krebs cycle cycle. Um, so typically mitochondria are, are measured, mitochondrial respiration is measured in the presence of pyruvate plus a substrate such as malate or glutamate or alpha-ketoglutarate just to make the Krebs cycle work uh, in a more functional manner. You can also use complex two linked substrate succinate. Uh, this is going to feed electrons through complex two. You can use a combination of these substrates which probably is more physiologically relevant. If you're studying beta oxidation, it might be interesting to use lipid molecules such as acyl-CoA plus carnitin or acyl-carnitin. It's not easy to measure respiration in the presence of lipids because they can also uncouple. So you have to be very careful with the amount of these lipids that you give mitochondria and also if you're conjugating them with a protein, for example, BSA. Glycerol phosphate is also a good substrate for mitochondria. It's going to feed electrons to uh, coenzyme Q through glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase in mitochondria that have glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase activity. Um, so different substrates for different conditions. It depends on what you want to measure. Another thing that oxygen consumption measurements can be used for is to titrate the amount of detergent that you need for cell permeabilization. So I told you in the prior video that when you're permeabilizing cells or tissues, 
it's really important to titrate the amount of detergent so that you're permeabilizing plasma membrane but not mitochondrial membranes. Independently of how much the detergent you're using is specific for one kind of membrane, I really think it's important to titrate. So a way to determine optimal quantities of detergents can be by monitoring mitochondrial oxygen consumption. What I do is I incubate cells in the presence of rotenone plus succinate. Intact cells incubated in rotenone plus succinate are not going to respire because rotenone is going to inhibit complex 1. Succinate can donate electrons to complex 2, therefore restoring respiration, but succinate is not permeable to the plasma membrane. So when mitochondria respire here is when the plasma membrane is permeable. Before the plasma membrane is permeable, there will be no respiration with rotenone and succinate. Then what you do is add something to make respiration as fast as it can be. So you add ADP plus phosphate or an uncoupler to maximize respiration and titrate the quantities of detergent. So add step by step a little bit of detergent until you start seeing respiration. And you continue adding more and more detergent until you start seeing respiration decrease again because mitochondria are now being permeabilized. The ideal quantity of detergent is going to be the quantity of detergent that generates maximal respiration. The first addition of detergent that generates the maximal respiratory rate under these conditions. And after you've done this experiment, you can now maintain this quantity of detergent for your other permeabilized cell experiments, and you know that you have a selective permeabilization of the plasma membrane and not of the mitochondrial membrane. So that's what I want to talk about, mitochondrial oxygen consumption. I'm going to come back in the next video talking about how to measure mitochondrial membrane potentials as a proxy for proton motive force. So until then. <laughs>